thanks. It's a great honor to be here. Uh, at the risk of being a little bit pretentious, I'm going to start with a parable. There's a man, happy, minding his own business, who sees an open gate in the corner of the room where he is. He looks at the gate and wonders where it leads to. So he decides to approach the gate. As he approaches it, he seems to see that it's guarded. The guard, who did look very powerful at a distance, actually seems quite unkempt close up. But the guard warns him that nobody's ever been through this gate. And in fact, just through this gate, there's only another gate with a guard that's even more powerful. So the man backs away, spends his years, which turn into decades, wondering about that gate and where it might lead to. Eventually, when his own death is near and he's old, he realizes what he should have actually asked the guard. So he shuffles back to the guard and says, in all the time I've been in this room, why has nobody ever been through that gate? The guard realizes his own death is near and bellows back to him, because this gate was only meant for you. But it's too late now. The parable, written in 1914 by Franz Kafka, has inspired me often. Any great parable works in many ways, but this inspires me in at least two ways. One is that as a scientist, my job is to walk through gates where nobody has been before. Secondly, there's the simple but all too easy to forget truth that each one of us is unique right down to the molecular details of what we're made of. And what I want to talk to you about today are a few human genes. Each of us has about 25,000 genes, the human genome, and by and large, we all have roughly the same kinds of genes. About 0.1% of our genes, however, are different. They vary between each person in this room uh, and me. And you might think that the genes that vary the most between each of us in this room would be things, the genes that control things like our hair color, our eye color, our skin color. But it turns out the genes that vary the most between each individual in this room have nothing to do with how we physically look at all. The genes that vary the most between you and me and every other person in this room are what uh, we call our compatibility genes. Now, the fact that they vary between each of us is how they were discovered in the first place. This is Peter Medwar, uh, a well-known scientist who won the Nobel Prize many years ago. And in 1940, he was sitting in his uh, garden in Oxford and a plane crashed nearby. He was called into the Oxford War Wounds Hospital to help the airmen who lay in agony. At the time, he was an expert in antibiotics, and it was clear that he had to use antibiotics to treat these war wounds. The problem was that when you could treat the wound to prevent an infection, there was still no way of actually helping the wound heal. There was always a problem in taking skin from one person and putting it, grafting it onto the person in trouble. The thinking at the time was just that you needed to perfect the surgical procedure. Surely everyone's skin is the same, pretty much, made of the same stuff, the atoms, the molecules, the cells. Peter Medwar saw the agony of these airmen in the War Wounds Hospital and decided that he needed to do something about that. He needed to solve this problem with transplantation and moving skin from one person to the next. First thing he did was look carefully with a microscope at what happens when you graft skin from one person to the next. And he saw that immune cells went into the skin. They seemed to be involved in the way that the transplantation didn't work. A crucial experiment that he did with a surgeon, Tom Gibson, in Glasgow, was he grafted skin from the same person that donated the, a first set of skin a second time around and noticed that the skin got rejected. The transplant did not work even faster a second time round. A reaction that happens even faster a second time round is the hallmark of an immune response. And that was a crucial step in our understanding that the reason transplant doesn't work easily from one person to the next is because of an immune reaction. Your immune system reacts against the skin from somebody else. Skin is not the same between each person because there are these few genes that vary from one person to the next. 
That got us onto the right pathway of solving the transplantation problem in our understanding of why it is you can't easily graft skin from one person to the next. And today, we have to match genes between people to allow transplantation to work and become the medical uh, life safer that it is. Organ transplantation works well when these genes are matched. Right, but the role of these genes in the human body can't be to do with making life difficult for transplant surgeons. The question is, what do these genes really do? So that's an adventure that's taken us the last 60 years to understand. This is the bit of science about what these genes really do. The genes that vary the most between you and me and each person in this room make this molecule here. This is a protein molecule, and it's on the surface of nearly all of your cells. Now, what happens is that inside your cells, all the protein molecules that a cell is currently being ma made is chopped up into small pieces, and those pieces are put at the surface of the cell inside the groove here. This yellow molecule is this molecule, and this red dot is this piece here. This is a small sample of what's being made inside this cell. So at the surface of your cell, there's this molecule, and small samples of what's being made are put up at the surface of the cell in this groove of this protein. And then your immune cells, this is the surface of an immune cell called a T cell, has a receptor to look at these samples of what this cell is making. And if it sees something that's never been in your body before, then the immune cell knows that there's something wrong with that cell. For example, it might be infected with a virus, and it proceeds to attack the cell. That's what these genes do, make that molecule that reports what's being made inside cells. Now, the fact that we all have different versions of these genes means that we all make slightly different shapes of, these of this protein. In particular, regions around here vary from one person to the next in the versions of these genes that we've inherited. So that means we're all slightly better or worse or pre pre uh, uh, presenting different samples of what's being made inside cells. As a consequence of that, it means that the versions of these genes that you inherited, that are generally different between each of us in this room, influence how you will fare in almost any illness. These genes influence how you will fare in almost any illness. Now, if that wasn't enough to make these genes uh, incredibly important, then in the mid 90s, experiments were done that seemed to indicate these genes have a role in a whole other area of human biology. So men were asked to uh, not shower for a couple of days, uh, refrain from sex, not enter into a smelly room, uh, and then t-shirts that they kept wearing for a couple of days were ranked by women according to how those t-shirts smelt. And they were asked to rank the t-shirts according to how pleasant they smelt, how sexy they smelt, and how intense they smelt. And it turned out that women preferred the smell of t-shirts worn by men who had different versions of these genes to themselves. So the explosive conclusion that comes from that would be that we might prefer sexual partners that have different versions of these genes to ourselves. The problems are that this ex these experiments are incredibly controversial for many, many reasons. One is that the way the experiment was done was quite dramatic. For example, women were asked to read a particular book uh, about smell in preparation for the experiment, which is not the usual way science is done. Uh, you know, what would happen if they were asked to give, read a different book? Surely these results aren't dependent on a book that you read. But more deeply than that, smell is a very, very difficult thing to study. You know, it's very easy to quantify sound. It's digitized in any download or CD. It's very easy to, to quantify an image. You know, it's projected here in, in a digital uh, way on the screen. But it's very, very difficult to study smell because there is no way of quantifying that. How do you describe the smell of vanilla? The other problem is that if women would rank the smell of T-shirts, giving them, say, 6 out of 10, uh, as opposed to, say, 5 out of 10, you can see how you would do some statistical test to prove that that was accurate, that women would rank a certain smell of T-shirts higher than others. But ranking the smell of a T-shirt in a, in a laboratory condition as 6 out of 10 out of 5 out of 10 is one thing. And how would you know uh, whether or not that small difference 
would have any impact in, in, in actual behavior in everyday life. So the experiments remain controversial. But there are experiments done in animals uh, where, for example, mice uh, run down a Y-shaped maze, and they do go to the track to find another mouse uh, to mate with according to the versions of these genes that they have. But they do that by smelling each other's urine, which is a skill lost in us. Um, so it remains uh, difficult to know how important that is in everyday life. But very recent experiments have also shown that the immune system regulates how the placenta develops when nutrients are exchanged between uh, the mother and the baby. And that, in turn, influences uh, the likelihood of a successful uh, pregnancy. For example, some problems in pregnancy, such as preeclampsia, do occur uh, more frequently with particular combinations of these genes between the mother and father. So it seems that these few genes influence who lives and who dies at all different levels. Our diversity in these genes is essential to how we survive disease. Each of us has a different ability to, 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 to fare in different illnesses, like I showed you in the immune system. And these other areas of biology that seem to be influenced by these same genes works to keep the genes diverse. These are the genes that vary the most between each of us in this room, and the system requires that to be true. It re the way that we've evolved to survive disease requires this exceptional diversity. Because if a virus affected, say, one group of people in this room, then you don't want to... Then, then other people in this room would be better at fighting uh, that virus, but you don't want that then to limit the diversity we have as a population, so these other aspects of human biology serve to, again, increase our diversity back out again, so that we are, as a population, as a species, uh, uh, strong at fighting all kinds of uh, possible uh, diseases. But crucially, there's no hierarchy in this system. You might have a gene that makes you more susceptible to some type of disease, like an autoimmune disease, perhaps asthma, for example. But then with that same set of genes, you will be stronger at fighting some other illness. There's clear examples where a gene that is uh, particularly good at allowing you to fight off uh, HIV or delay the progression of HIV to AIDS is the very same gene that makes you more susceptible to an autoimmune disease, for example. So there's no hierarchy. No one has a better or worse set of these genes. It's the diversity that's crucial. In effect, this 60-year-long adventure shows us that it's the ultimate celebration of our diversity. The way our species has evolved to survive disease requires us to have exceptional differences in these particular set of these genes. Six decades of research show the compatibility gene that it, to be our uniqueness. It's the thing that varies the most between each of us in this room, but it's also our togetherness because it's this clear connection that we have between us that comes from the way our species have evolved to survive disease. So I mentioned at the beginning uh, the parable uh, from Franz Kafka about uh, the gate that was guarded, but it was meant for you. And in any parable, there's many interpretations. The guard and the man might be one and the same, because stepping somewhere new is an internal struggle. Also, even though the guard said it's too late now, I don't think that's true, because gates into new rooms of knowledge don't open and close to fit one man's life. There are many doors ajar. Walk through them. Thanks for listening.